All right, I am here with Paige Lawrence, former Olympian Paige Lawrence. I'm uh, really looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So before we started, I you know we talked a little bit about uh, you know being being somewhat kindred spirits. I think in our our view and and how the habits developed in in high level athletics transition so well to the business world, especially with entrepreneurship. Uh, I know with me, I, I think it really started to connect. I was the COO of this startup called events.com. We scaled pretty rapidly. We had about a hundred employees at the time. And I found myself constantly re uh, referring back to my athletic career, just in, in regards to like competition and our ability to persevere and, you know, all the different types of things that we needed to be able to do to be successful and, you know, in a, in a highly competitive world. Uh, when did that, when did you connect those dots? When did you start to go, you know what? Like, I mean, I, I got to the highest level that you can really achieve in my particular sport. This is something that can be translated to the business world. I need to help people understand how to do it. So for me, shortly after the Olympics, I mean, as you said, there's, there's a lot of parallels between sport and business. And after the Olympics, a lot of corporations, businesses, they tend to look for and hire Olympians as like a motivational speaker, right? And so I was starting to get into this line of work and I'd go in and share my story and people would love it and eat it up. And then I would leave and I realized it wasn't really an effective change maker, right? People were listening and they're happy for you and they think it's a great story, but they don't change anything. And so for me, I was like, I knew that I really loved sharing the messages that sport taught me. I could see that other people found value in it in the business environment. And yet I knew that it wasn't a satisfactory answer, like motivational speaking alone was not everything that I wanted to do. And so I really just started to look at myself and exploring different op options of how I could be more of an effective change maker and really help people to step into learning the lessons that sport taught me to bring about positive change in their life. Yeah. I, I, you know, I've spoken to with a lot of athletes, uh, a lot of professional athletes, you know, baseball, football, basketball, uh, hockey. Um, I think you might be the first Olympian I've spoken with. I have, Great. yeah, totally. Uh, I, I have such a high regard. I, I love the Olympics. I love the, the nature of the moment that is so unique in, in many Olympic sports, right? Like, in a football game, yeah, there's moments, but it's it's this thing that goes on over a period of time, or basketball, or baseball, or whatever it is. But you know, when you when you watch the Olympics, and I'm sure when you're you're training and you're qualifying, it it really is a moment, right? Like, I mean, in gymnastics, it could be like a single vault, right? You're talking ten seconds. It's going to make a difference between whether you, you know, live a lifelong dream, or quite frankly, it it, it could all go away. And 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 you're in one of those sports. Uh, I'd love to just hear a little bit about your background and how you got into, um, you know, the, the figure skating. I know you were in pairs uh, and, and what that journey was like and, and how you made it to the Olympics. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's the Olympics is such a unique beast in sport, right? Because it's not just physical fitness. It's not just performing on the greatest stage. It's also timing. It's yeah. every four years. There's so much that goes into peaking at the right moment or missing out on an opportunity. So, so the training for the Olympics is very unique in the sense that you have to approach it so differently than just a world championship because you have another time or another chance the next year with the worlds, right? So all I'll just say, I'll go back to the beginning. I really got into figure skating simply because I grew up in a small town in Canada and there's nothing else to do in the winter. It's like our biggest form of recreation. Every small town has a rink. My town was like 250 people. Everyone learns to skate pretty much, right? And so I started to skate just because that's what everyone did. I quickly realized I really enjoyed figure skating and I had wonderful parents. I have to give them a lot of credit. When I was nine years old, they gave me an opportunity to go to a summer camp because my brother, older brother was doing a hockey camp. And this was really my first experience with other figure skaters who it sounds 
kind of funny right now that were better than me. And my my small town, I wasn't very good, but I was one of the best, you know? So nine-year-old Paige saw that other people were better than me and were getting better training. And I was like, what? Like, no, 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 I'm competitive. I want to be the best. And my parents really fostered that competitiveness. We left that summer camp and they helped me to find a coach in a training center in a town 20 minutes away that was more elevated, higher performers, better coaching. And to be honest, it's very unique, but that's the coach that ended up taking me to the Olympics like 15 years later. And so it was really just an evolution of, I love to figure skate. I want to get better at this and finding a coach who was also willing to continuously learn and strive for more. And so it was just a pretty cool opportunity and kind of like twist of fate that led to provincial championships and then led to the national team and then led to the Olympics. When when did, when did Olympics become your goal? So I remember being 11 years old and having the first realization that Olympians are just regular people. I was listening to an Olympic figure skater talk at a seminar, and it was the first time that struck me like, oh, she was just a regular kid, which means I could go to Olympics. So, I mean, I I remember right then writing it down a piece of paper and little 11 year old me was honestly a, a little bit ashamed and embarrassed. I remember like covering it up and like, I don't want anyone else to see because it wasn't at that point in time, didn't feel like a realistic goal. But fast forward, and when I was 16 years old, I'd been skating pairs for a year and a half. And it was, I guess, 2006, 2007. So we're coming up into the prep phase for the 2010 Olympics. All of us athletes, we operate in quads. So we operate in four-year cycles. We were about two years into this cycle and we knew that we were going to be competing at the right level for the 2010 Olympics. So therefore the question pops up, do we think this is an attainable goal? The answer was no. (laughs) No, 2010 is not an attainable goal for us. But we had that moment said, hey, would 2014 be an, like a, an attainable? Had you, had you already started working with your uh, figure skating partner at that point? Yes. Yep. So I started skating with him when I was 15. So coming into our second year of training together, we were having this conversation. So it was about seven years out from 2014 Olympics when we said, well, maybe eight years out, where we said, yeah, 2014 Olympics is attainable. It's realistic. Let's go for it. I love it. Uh, and when, you know, when I have a nine year old and uh, a 12 year old and uh, both, both daughters and they're both competitive athletes, very talented. Uh, and there's always that balance between like being supportive and then at the same time pushing them. Right. And, you know, I, I think that uh, sometimes elite athletes is just innate, you know, with you, like, it sounds like you had a little bit of that competitive drive just inside of you. And it wasn't necessarily your parents were pushing you towards it. You were like, well, wait a second. I, I, I love this. I want to be the best, you know, and then they were there to support you versus them pushing you into it. Yes, most definitely. I was driving the dream. I think that one of the greatest things that my parents and my coach taught me and instilled in me was accountability. Meaning they said at the very young age of nine, we are willing to drive you to this better coach. We're willing to pay and like to do the thing. But if you make that decision, it's your job to work hard. It's your job to show up ready to learn. It's your job to actually follow through on this. And they held me accountable to that as a kiddo. So they would, we would drive home from skating and they would be like, well, how hard do you think you worked today? Or like, how committed were you? How concentrating, concentrated were you at training? And we would have these conversations to help me learn how to self-evaluate, to say like, oh yeah, I actually like just sat and visited for an hour. You know, that was a waste of everybody's time. So they taught me accountability at a young age for what I said, for what I said I wanted. And my coach was super fundamental. I remember around 12 years old, I went to her and I remember it was about a birthday party of a friend. And I was like, can I miss skating on this Sunday morning so I can go to this birthday party? I expected my coach to either tell me, yes, I could go to the party so I can avoid practice guilt-free, or she would tell me no, and I could blame her for not being able to go and do the fun thing, and I would show up and resent her and, you know, 
she had to take the responsibility for the decision. But what she said to me nonchalantly was you do what you think is best. And then she skated off. And I remember being frustrated by this. Like, what do you mean? I do. I think is best. Like you're the coach. Tell me, tell me what to do here. And it was in that moment that I realized, no, I have to take accountability for what I want. No one else is going to do this for me. Nobody else is going to decide that I'm capable. Nobody else is going to decide for me to show up and do the work. So if I say I want this goal of, I mean, at that point in time, it was like making provincial team. I have to make the decisions that support that. And so I think it was a really beautiful mix of them just being unbiased supporters. I love you. I want to help you. And you said you want to do this. I'm going to hold you accountable so that you take responsibility for it and you drive the car to the dream. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I already see some of uh, knowing, knowing a little bit about your, your career now as a, as a coach and a mentor in in the world. I know some of your philosophies, uh, you can already start to see some of those, those those themes being (laughs) developed at that early age. Uh, I, I am curious though, as a nine, 10, 11 year old, what were the decisions you were making? Uh, were you, were you choosing the practice over the parties and doing that thing? Yeah. Yeah. In those moments where I really thought about it, I was like, okay, well I could go to this party. I essentially have permission. She's not going to, my coach isn't going to be upset. My parents aren't going to be upset, but I was like forced to evaluate this from the standpoint of, I said, I wanted to make provincial team this year. And maybe this one practice isn't going to be a make or break, but I know that if I don't make the team, I'm going to look back on that decision to go to the birthday party and I'm going to regret it. So I chose to go to the practice. That's so unbelievably mature for (laughs) a a kid of that age. I mean, it really is. Um, But I, but I I think that's, you know, that's makes the difference between why, you know, some people grow up to be Olympians and, and most uh, do not. So, um, I, I'm really interested in hearing, because you know the the Olympics. It, it it feels like it would be the apex of what your your you know uh, skating career was. Uh, what what was that? I mean, tell me tell me when you found out you made it. Like it was it like an yeah. individual event or was it like a culmination of a number of events? How did that work? Yeah, it was a incredibly stressful year. 2013 was the year leading up to 2014 Olympics, obviously. Yeah. So that that season of competition is incredibly important for a lot of reasons. But there is a selection committee. There is like our Skate Canada organizing committee is watching every competition. They're having conversations with you about your practices. Like you are being monitored. So it's incredibly stressful. Um, add to it the fall about October I experienced an injury I pulled my groin and had a hamstring strain and psoas which is an ab muscle Mm -hmm. strain so I had to really alter my training um I really had to alter my perspective I mean it was a huge change and pivot pivotal moment in my career because we were about three months out from our olympic qualifying event this is essentially the do or die event where despite all the monitoring despite your qualifications you had to show up at nationals and at this year you had to place top three in the pairs event to go to the olympics so it was really a do or die moment and so for us, we were incredibly stressed just with the year leading up to it. We were incredibly stressed due to the change in how we had to alter our training. And we really learned to make the most of that. I mean, it's like a crazy story to tell now about how it was the best thing ever for me to pull yeah. my groin, you know, but it forced us to approach our goal with a very different perspective. It taught us to really be so grateful for the elements that we got to do as my body began to heal. And when we showed up to nationals, we knew it was a do or die, but we also knew that we were the best we were gonna be. We had done, mm-hmm. we had jumped through all the hoops, we had overcome all the obstacles. My body was about 80% ready to go. We'd only been training like all of our elements for about three weeks prior leading up to this. So it was really a practice in, can we put everything aside and can we show up in this moment and to be our best? And to be honest with you, we made one really big mistake. We made one huge mistake in the qualifying event so that when I got off the ice, 
I remember, remember kind of going like catatonic almost. Like I was just sitting waiting for our results and I knew it was going to be so incredibly close, but the person that was like the team that was behind us, that was trying to get our spot, which was the third position. I was like, they had a great skate. And I remember just sitting there and my coach had done the math. She was like, you just need to be more than 113. She's like mouthing this because the cameras yeah. were on us. She's like whispering it under her breath. Like, you just have to be more than 113. And I remember the marks came up and it was this out of body experience. I ugly cried. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a crier, but like, it was the first time, like I was just so emotional for yeah. having accomplished the dream I would say that to be honest like competing at the Olympics was the best experience it was the highlight it was the cherry on top but qualifying for the Olympics was the most emotional experience of my entire yeah. life the most high pressure like it, it, it's it's unrelatable thank yeah. god it's unrelatable I don't care to be in that position ever again yeah <laughs> Well, it's like the Olympics are the reward, right? It was like yeah. all that work that you put into your, you know, into this since you were nine years old finally pays off and you, you know, you, you're able to live this lifelong dream. It's like you get there and hopefully you're able to enjoy the experience. But yeah, it, it, it makes me think of like that, that Eminem song, Lose Yourself, you know, where it's like yes. you got that one, that one shot, that one <laughs> opportunity, like, can you make it happen? You know? Yes, it is. It is wild. Um, yeah to think about a lifetime of work, which is really what it came down to at this point. I was 23 at qualifying. It was a lifetime of work that came down to a two and a half minute program and a four minute and 37 second minute program. Yeah, Like that's what my life came down to was those two opportunities. Um, and so it is a very polarizing experience. Olympic qualifying events, I think everyone either has a traumatic experience or the most beautiful magical moment of their life. It's one of the two. That's right. And, and so how long before that moment and then, you know, you're off, I mean, you're, it's Sochi that year. So yes. you're, you're going to Russia. Um, yes. what, how long, I mean, what was that period like? I mean, are you like, do you get to, to kind of stop and smell the roses and enjoy it? Or is it like right back to work? Oh ready? gosh, no, no. It was about under a month turnaround. So we qualified January, I want to say 12th or 13th. And we flew out, I think maybe like February 2nd. So it was about two or three weeks of just going back home. And this is a part of figure skating that I think we actually got to rely on training because in comp competitive season, there is international competition. You come home, you have a quick deload, reload type of mm -hmm. situation. And so we leaned on what we knew. We came home from our qualifying event. We had a really short, like, deload recovery period. And then it was a revamp for the two and a half weeks leading up to departure. Um, and so that, that actually was nice because it felt like what we knew. We got to, like, yeah. go back into, it is the Olympics that we're going to, but hey, you know what? Let's focus on the controllables. Let's focus on the similarities and the knowns here. Sure. So when you get there, your Olympic village, you're surrounded by, I mean, just unbelievable athletes from all over the world. What are, what are some of the, the, the takeaways that, uh, you know, you came away with from that? I had a really amazing experience my first night in the village. So each country kind of has their own apartment complexes and blocks and team Canada, we had about one floor on in one of the apartment buildings that was devoted to an athlete lounge we're there for three weeks and so this is a place with snacks little kitchenette there's tvs and xboxes and ping pong it was the place for us to just to live right into it's like a communal place and so i remember going into the athlete lounge my first night and having a moment of total imposter syndrome of yeah. who am I to be at the Olympics surrounded by Olympians? Like Olympians are people that I grew up watching on TV. And I'm just little old page from Kennedy, Saskatchewan, which nobody knows, like, what am I doing here? And this isn't like me. I'm typically a very outgoing person. And so I had to really give myself a pep talk. I eventually sat down at this table and was playing cards with a bunch of different athletes and was mingling. And 
I remember having a conversation, a normal conversation with this guy beside me that I just met. His name was Denny. He was from a small town. I was from a small town. He was a speed skater and had overcome like little things. Like I was just finding so many connections. And I walked away from that night being like, "Ah, I feel like I connected with somebody else who was probably feeling a little out of place. And, you know, like me, like maybe I didn't belong. And anyways, I went back to my room that night I was on social media. I think Facebook was like the popular thing at the time. And I came across this article with a bunch of Canadian Olympic athletes. I clicked on it and I was scanning it and I recognized a face of the guy I was just talking to. And turns out he was a Olympic medalist in speed skating. He was a world champion. And I'm like, you are such a dork page. How did you not know you were talking to the elite, like the best of the best? Yeah, I saw him the next day and I walked up to him and kind of smacked him on the shoulder and was like, Denny, why didn't you tell me you were so good? Like, I was just talking to you thinking that, you know, you were like me. And he's like, looked at me kind of funny. He goes, well, we're at the Olympics page. We're all pretty good. (laughs) (laughs) It sounds so silly, but for me, it was a light bulb moment and it was permission to belong and to take up space and to meet people as individuals rather than just their resumes. And that changed the entire Olympic experience for me. And it's honestly shifted my viewpoint of life in general, where I don't necessarily view people just based on their accomplishments, the amazing things that they've done, because at the end of the day, we're all humans and we're all regular, despite being extraordinary in different capacities. And so for me, this was really the turning point. Thankfully, it happened first night where I stepped into that Olympic experience and I was just soaking it up when I was on the ice. I belonged. I was taking everything for full effect. When I was off the ice mingling, I was taking up space. I belonged. I was meeting people and connecting. And so it really helped set the scene for what was the best three weeks and experience of my entire life. It is um, again, unrelatable. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how amazing of a story. So uh, how, um, how far into the, the three week period did you have to actually compete and perform? So we were, we competed at the beginning of the second week. So really okay. quite early on, to be honest, we practiced, yeah. um, once or twice a day for that first week. It was really great. Got our legs underneath us. We got to acclimatize to the time change. But it wasn't so long, you know, that that we were just like biting our nails ready to go. Was, I honestly feel like it was a perfect scenario for us. Yeah. And we also had about a week and a half afterwards to just have fun and to yeah. cheer other people's on and to enjoy the Olympic experience outside of being a competitor. So it was a perfect timing for me. I, I would imagine that the whole... Um the village gets looser and looser as more athletes are done competing. Yes. Right. It's like, <laughs> like the, yes. the, the, go ahead. I feel bad for some of the athletes that are like last day because everyone is blowing off steam. The, the total atmosphere changes at work. First it's everyone is so serious and so tense and like the, the energy is palpable And by the end of it, it's like everyone is having a great time and everyone is done except for these few select people who are like, I'm still in a bubble. (laughs) I know you're having fun. I can't talk to you. I'm still in a bubble. I'm still focused on my own thing. And so it is you're having very different experiences at that point in time. Yeah. So you're what, what, 23 years old at this time. Uh, You're, you as you said, you got the four year cycle. So I'm assuming you're kind of looking at this thing and you're like, I'm you know, I'm not, I'm not hanging in here until, you know, 2018. Right. So I, or, or what was your thought at this point? I mean, you know, you're, you know, you've kind of hit the the peak of your career and now you make a decision whether you're going to start the cycle again or whether you move on with your life. Yeah, it was a tough one for me. I would say, I feel like, um, I, I personally as a competitor was just stepping into My peak period, I was really owning who I was as a person on and off the ice, the confidence was there. I really felt like that if the stars had been perfectly aligned, I could have gone four more years. That being said, my partner and I, we had a really volatile relationship. 
we didn't get along that well. We we had got to this point because we could put our differences aside to train, but it was it was not the vehicle that would have been sustainable for another four years. And so ultimately our partnership ended after the Olympics quite shortly. We went to Worlds a month later and then a month after that we split. And so at that point, it was really a, a matter of, do I want to start all over again with a new partner and try to go again in four years? Or is this an opportunity to move on with my life? And I dabbled with the idea of trying to find a new partner. Yeah. And it just didn't seem to be uh, in the cards for me. And yeah. so retirement was the choice. You know, that's fascinating to hear just, you know, as a, as a fan, someone who's, you know, loves the Olympics and watches the Olympics and have, have seen, you know, pair figure skating so many times that relationship between the, the, the man and the female is, is always, it's kind of interesting, right? Because it's such a, I mean, it's clearly a close relationship you have to have, right? I mean, you were so in sync and then there's like an intimacy that needs to kind of form, I think, in order to get the emotions across and the actual yeah. event. I mean, I, I would assume it's a little bit like maybe being a co-star in a movie where <laughs> you're maybe sometimes it's real, but it sounds like sometimes it's like you kind of got to fake that closeness, but you're really just co-competitors. I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, every relationship, to be honest, is very unique. Yeah. Um, and I think that you're right. I mean, most people, I mean, what we were always told is you have to make people believe that you're in love. That's what, we're, that's what everyone's looking for, right? Yeah. We want to see connection on the ice. And I get that. I would say our dynamic of when we were being on, so on the ice performing was very different. It was forced. It was fake. Yeah. <laughs> it was practiced. And our dynamic in just simply like behind the scenes in practice was also very different yeah. and not to say it's any less intimate because there is an intimacy that has to be there. There's a, a, a trust that mm -hmm. is non-negotiable. There is a ridiculous amount of time that you spend with one another, you know, the ins and outs of, of your partner. And I also think that like, it is important to note that that doesn't mean you're best friends. It's yeah. obviously great if that's the case, but you are two individuals put together with crazy amounts of stress placed on you. Um, crazy deadlines, crazy timelines. Like it is a, it, it's honestly set up to be chaotic and stressful. And I think that really brings about different parts of a relationship. Um, and also we're young. Like I started skating with my partner when I was 15 yeah. and we skated together for nine years. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes, but our job as competitors is to show up and to portray what people want to see. Yeah. Fascinating. Uh, all right. Let's, <laughs> I, I could continue to like geek out just talking <laughs> to you about this stuff forever, but let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about the transition. I, you know, one of the things is probably most common uh, with the people I interview, especially the people who were, you know, the peak athletes, um, is that transition and moving away from, you know, their sport in which they were one of the best. And there was a lot of esteem on their role. And in many ways, they, they identified their own self-worth and personality with that, that, that sport. And then you, you move away where, you know, that structure is not necessarily there anymore, right? You don't have a coach telling you what to do. You don't have a place to be all the time. Uh, your goals maybe aren't as clear as they once were. And, and, and it's, it can be difficult for, for a lot of athletes. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that transition. I mean, you, you, you mentioned the speaking part of it, but I'd, I'd love to hear you, you know, kind of help me understand how you made that move from, okay, I'm, I'm going to, go down this new path. I'm putting my energy and efforts into doing this new thing. Yeah. Transition was a tough one for me. And to be honest, it was quite messy. I retired, like I said, at a time where I hadn't really planned on retiring. Like ideally I would have gone another four years. And so retirement and suddenly not having a purpose and not having goals and not having that structure, it was really hard on me. And I did struggle with the loss of identity and I really struggled with the loss of purpose. I had mm -hmm. lived a life where I could tell you a year from now what I would be doing on a Thursday afternoon at 3 p.m. 
sure. you know? Yeah. And so it was a little bit of unlearning all of the extremes of sport that actually weren't, that don't exist in the real world, you know? And so I would say for about a year, I struggled. I started coaching figure skating. Again, it was all about moving forward. It was identifying some new goals, but I, I didn't know with certainty anything. And so I would say my saving grace is I had a wonderful sports psychologist that I had worked with throughout my career. And we had a really hard conversation early into my retirement about crafting a new vision. And I had just gone from a very specific vision. I want to go to the Olympics to what we ended up on was super vague. It was, I wanted to be happy in the 10 years. I wanted to be happy. I wanted to be doing something that I was passionate about because I knew that I could never settle for waking up and going to a job that I didn't love every single day. I wanted to have autonomy over my time and my schedule. I'd never experienced that before. (laughs) I wanted to be financially secure. That was it. Yeah. And so with that in mind, I did what I could. I would make an educated, informed decision that I thought would be in the direct, lead me in the direction of that. If it was a yes, great. I expanded on it. If it was a no, awesome. I learned something and I made a course correction. And so really it was just this four year process of trial and error, trying, going back to college, trying to work outside of figure skating, coming back to coaching figure skating, taking different courses on whims. I literally signed up for a positive psychology practitioner's course because I read about it in a book and was like, that sounds interesting. Yeah. That in turn actually led me to a life coaching certification that in turn led me to talking to an advisor and getting accepted into a graduate's degree program in executive coaching. That in turn led me to starting my own business as a high performance coach for entrepreneurs. And so it really was this beautiful mess of having a vague yet clear enough vision and just trying to solve for it through trial and error. We, we talk a lot about, and, and, you know, companies that I've, I've been a part of and running just this concept of a North star, right? Like you got to have this North star, you got to have this guy in light, like where are we going? And, and I think that's a really good example of that, right? Like you, you, even though it sounded kind of vague of what your goals were in this period of time, it at least gave you that guiding light so that every time you had to make a decision, you could just ask yourself, is this aligned with what I'm trying to accomplish? Right. And uh, is that something that you've taken forward in your own coaching practice? Most definitely. So I would say a lot of what I learned through this period was how to rely on things I had learned in sport that I could translate to help me in life outside of sport. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of things I was bringing in from sport, my yearly goal planning, something that we did every year in our sport. And I really loved the structure that it provided. We used our yearly goal planning to come up with monthly goal setting. What were we going to focus on that month down to weekly, down to daily? That was purpose. That was structure. So I was bringing a lot of those types of things into my approach to solving for for what I wanted to do in Mm -hmm. life. So throughout this, I was leaning on a lot of these high performance habits and practices that I had learned as an athlete. And I was tweaking them and altering them to fit my life. And through that, I realized, you know, this actually works. It gets you from A to B to C to D. And that's actually one of the reasons why I started my own business was because I wanted to utilize my own framework. I wanted to utilize these things I'd learned as an elite athlete and bring them into the lives of businessmen and women, because I'm like, this stuff works. It's super practical. It's not some like fluffy sound good. It's, it's actually going to get you results. Um, it's worked for me and it's worked for a bunch of clients now, which is yeah. awesome. But that was really kind of like the onset of it is I'm like, I have all these things that work and I want to help other people because it doesn't have to be as hard as people are making it be. Yeah. Who do you, so who are you typically working with? Like what's an ideal client for you look like? So typically I would say I'm working with entrepreneurs, digital Mm -hmm. business owners. Typically there's a few that I have like brick and mortar, um, but typically they're digital, digital business owners um, that are really moving from that like five figure mark to the six figure mark Mm -hmm. where they're actually honing in on optimizing themselves, optimizing their own unique ways that they can show up and, and enhance 
what they're doing to get better results. Yeah. And when you start, like what's, do you have like, I mean, I, I know you have a framework, um, but like, what's your starting point typically when you're, when you're working with a new, new client? It's preparation. It's strategizing. It's crafting a North star. So I yeah. want to know what we're working on. And then it's yearly planning. I think this is something that is so underutilized with people, you know, like people set goals or they don't set goals. And I'm not here to argue about that. Goal setting works if you do it correctly. Yearly right. planning works if you do it correctly. It gives you structure. It gives you clear, tangible things to drive yourself for every single day. And so for me, before we do anything else, we are getting some solid preparation down. We're doing some strategy. We're doing vision. We're doing goal setting. Yeah. So you said you're setting goals. And then, you know, I know one of the things you talk a lot about is this concept of deliberate practice, which is... Yes. Uh, you know, it's so clear in, in your athletic career, how, how important deliberate practice is. Um, how, how does that transition to the business world? Like when you're working with an entrepreneur or a CEO or someone like that, like what exactly do you mean by deliberate practice? So it, it goes hand in hand with the planning. It's taking this idea of yearly goal setting and then it's breaking it down to checking in on those, checking in on your progress monthly, setting really clear mm -hmm. markers for the progress you want to make that specific month and then taking it down into, okay, great. What does that mean for weekly to do? So we're getting yeah. super intentional with how you're spending your time. That's going to allow you to set really purposeful daily plans of action. So you're mm -hmm. showing up and you know that what you're doing today has a purpose and is feeding into those bigger goals. So the, the, the having a purpose is a step one. I think of deliberate training <laughs> in, in yeah. business, having a plan that connects the dots all the way through. And then feedback is the other part, right? You have to take action. You have to show up day in, day out, and you have to check in and monitor your progress. You have to be accountable to say what's working, what's not working. Where do we need to adapt? What do I need to do differently so that I'm still meeting my markers? So I am accomplishing my weekly to-dos. So I am accomplishing my monthly to-dos. And so it's really just like this twofold thing, preparation and execution. They go hand in hand. You have to use them back and forth to make sure that you're on track and you're accomplishing what you say you want to accomplish. How do you, Again, it's like, it's, it's simple, but not easy. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, most, most things like this are, are super logical and they make all yeah. the sense in the world and we all know it, but it's, it's like eating healthy and working out. Like it's the most simple thing in the world. We don't always do it, right? And I think that's where the importance of coaching comes in, right? It's somebody that's there to not only, you know, help you understand how to do things, but also, like you said, hold people accountable, right? Like, hey, we sat down last week, we worked together. This is what you told me you want to accomplish. We agreed these were the things you needed to do. Now yeah. we're going to get together next week, you know, and now that person feels like they have to be held accountable for the things that they said. Yeah. 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 So, it's adding some clarity to the action that hopefully makes the follow through easier. And if not, there's accountability to say like, well, why aren't we doing this? Let's figure this out because not taking action, not achieving these things is not an option. Right. How do you like, when you think about this, you know, you think about an entrepreneur in that range, maybe they have a handful of employees, uh, working with the individual on themselves versus also helping them structure the organization, right? Like, it's like, I can sit down as, as, as a CEO of my own company and I can create my own goals and my own action items and my own steps. But then there's that next level step where it's like, now I want to sit down with all my direct reports and have them create their own goal setting. Do you, do you work between the two or do you, do you mostly focus on the entrepreneur and then let them kind of manage their own teams? It's a, I think it's a mix of both. I would say I'm usually hired to typically work with the one and there's a trickle down effect. I think there's, there's definitely something that comes from creating a role model of like actually following through and acting out the things that you're wanting to see in your employees Two, I think that through working with me, there's also starting to learn the process of setting goals and clearly yeah. communicating and establishing like the accountability of actions. And so we definitely have conversations that takes what we do and we break that down into like, how could this be translated to a third party? Um, 
again, I'm a really big advocate and believer of the power of goals. And so if this is something that a client is wanting as a goal is to become a better leader, we're going to break that down. And again, just look at it like, well, what components are we wanting to improve? Mm -hmm. I think clarity and goal setting leads to easier execution of actions. And so it's a, it's a mix of both is really what I'm saying here. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I'm still helping that leader to accomplish their goals. Yeah. What, when I, you know, my, and obviously coming from uh, a, a similar philosophy in regards to the, the um, parallels between athletics and, and entrepreneurship. I mean, the, the whole point of this podcast, I've, I've written my own list of things that I've seen those parallels. And I, I know accountability is high on that list. Um, coachability. I read a blog post you recently posted, uh, on, on coachability. Uh, what are, what are some of the other parallels that, you know, you are, are a big believer in that, that transition well from, from high level athletics to the, the business world? So I've talked about it a lot already, obviously the preparation, the strategy, yeah. that is one pillar that I think easily translates. The other thing I would say would be, um, what I call execution. The things yeah. that actually mean following through. And I guess it's also the things that stop people from executing, that stop athletes from performing. Things like our own upper limits or our limiting beliefs. Um, having the discipline and the practices to show up day in, day out, day out, doing the work. Mm -hmm. um, handling stress. You yeah. know, like these are all things that stop people from performing. And I think that that's really the other parallel here is how do you, how do you help entrepreneurs to show up and to excel yeah. in the moments that they have to excel? How do you help entrepreneurs to show up and do the work? Because again, action creates the results that they're looking for. And so for me, another big parallel is the execution. This is the training. This is yeah. the doing what you say you want to do. And it's the grunt work. It's not sexy. It's not fun necessarily, right? It's not glamorous. It's the hard work. It's the mindset shift. It's the working on yourself. It's the showing up. And gosh, that's the same when I'm running a business as it was when I was showing up to train on a day when I was skating. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, so many of the things you've mentioned, I, I think are, are, you know, things I see in the professional world. I mean, um, uh, imposter syndrome is one in general. You see it a lot yeah. with, with new entrepreneurs, especially, I mean, uh, where, you know, they're all of a sudden in a meeting and uh, or they're trying to raise capital and they're talking to a venture capitalist that they want and they've heard about and they've read about and, you know, they don't, oh, do I belong? Am I really good enough? I mean, all these people are so, and, and, you know, you just realize that everybody's just a person like you. And, and everybody has the same self doubts and, and, you know, all the different types of things, but you know, it, it sounds like what I, I think you bring to the table and, and what, you know, coaching in general brings to the table is once you put that like structure around things, it makes things a lot easier because you're taking out, you take out a little bit of that ability to have self doubt because you're not sitting there thinking about, oh, do I belong or am I doing the right thing? You, you're now just about executing, right? Because you've kind of set a roadmap. There's a there's a North Star you're going at. There's goals that you're trying to achieve on a weekly basis. And, and I think that's where, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs maybe don't know or see the value that can come with coaching. Um, but God, coaching is so important and, and it's not just in sports. I mean, it, it really does transition to the, the business world so well. 100%. I, and I think uh, this is something that I learned as an athlete when I first started working with a sports psychologist was I knew I was talented. I knew that I was a high performer. I was one of the best in our province. I knew I was capable of more, right? Like I knew I wasn't done yet. And yet I was doing everything that I already knew. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't seeing the change or the results that I wanted. And so I had to have this conversation with myself saying, if I'm doing everything that I know, and I know I have more to give, I'm missing something. So I need to work with somebody to help me uncover these other aspects of myself that's necessary for me to reach that next level. Yep. And I think that is the joy of coaching. That's what it brings to the table. It's saying, great, you want to get better? Let me help you discover all of the things that you don't yet know that will elevate you to that next level. 
That's right. And, you know, I, I had mentioned that blog post I, I read of yours on coachability, and it's also something I've talked about a lot. Um, I, you know, I think some people are maybe a little bit thin skinned and have a hard time hearing criticism, or don't want to hear any criticism, even though, you know, coaching is not really criticism. It's, it's there to kind of help people. Uh, but I, I especially think that it, it's, it can be very evident with entrepreneurs, especially entrepreneurs who had a little bit of success because they get into a situation where there's this belief that they are supposed to know everything, right? Especially if you have a team of people and people who manage you, you know, people you manage and, and you know, you're in a situation where you're supposed to have kind of all the answers. It's hard to admit that you don't, right? And, uh, I, you know, I, I know myself, I, I've had to, to deal with that a little bit myself where it's like, you gotta make yourself kind of vulnerable, right? A little bit and you gotta be open to coaching. Um, but you know, that coaching is so, so absolutely important in being able to improve yourself. If, if you don't have somebody that kind of helps you see some of your blind spots, how do you get better? Right? Yeah. hundred percent. So I, there's something you, uh, you know, you, you said, or, or, or wrote, and I, I kind of want to ask you this question because I think it plays into this coachability side where you have a three-step process for turning criticism and harsh feedback into positive growth. Uh, yeah. <laughs> at, wait, wait, can you walk me through that? Yeah, sure. So this is kind of one of those things that I didn't even realize was a superpower of mine until I started having more conversations with people. But I, I've always thrived on feedback. I've loved it. I've yeah. sought it out. I used to be notorious for saying to people, like coaches, like, don't tell me what I'm doing right. Tell me what I'm doing wrong so I can fix it. I'm like, I already know what I'm doing right. So just give me the, give me the good stuff. Yeah. And I realized that that's not really <laughs> how most people approach life in general. And so I really kind of, I, I, I slowed down. And I realized, okay, what am I doing with feedback? And there was a few real standout moments as an athlete where I was experiencing really harsh feedback that I evaluated to say, what was I doing? So what I kind of have is this three-step process, not kind of have, what I have is a three-step process. If the answer is no to the first question, you throw the feedback or criticism away, you move on with your life, giving it no time or energy. If it's a yes, you go to the second one. If it's a no, the second part's a no, you throw it out, you walk away from it, you don't give any more time or energy. And lastly, if you get to the third step, it's gonna like clarify everything. So step one is, is the feedback or criticism coming from someone that you trust or respect? This is huge because I yeah. think we all know that everyone and their dog has an opinion, right? Especially in the world of social media and the internet oh, where yeah. opinions are given freely, right? So for me, this is kind of the first indicator. Is it coming from someone that I trust and respect? Let's go into greater detail here related to the area that the feedback is coming to me from, right? I love my mom, but if she's giving me feedback on my business, I'm not necessarily going to give that the same weight as if a mentor or coach is giving me feedback. That's right. So if it's not coming from someone that I trust or respect, I'm throwing it away. It's no longer taking up space in my life. I'm just garbaging it. If it's a yes, yes, this is coming from someone I trust and respect. I'm going to go to point number two. Is this feedback or criticism meant to help me? Again, I think that a lot of people let emotions or reactions cloud their judgment. And I think that a lot of people are absolutely terrible at communicating. <laughs> <laughs> True. Right? I mean, let's just call a spade a spade. People are not generally trained in how to deliver great and effective feedback. Mm -hmm. And you throw into the fact that everyone is an emotional creature. A lot of times you're getting emotional feedback. And so I like to pause, take my emotions out of this question, and I like to actually look at the underlying message or meaning of what's going on here. Is what's being shared with me meant to help me, despite how poorly worded it may be or how it may make me feel? If the answer is no here, if it's just being shared to hurt me or anger me or point a finger at me or whatever, guess what? We're throwing it out. It's garbage. It's not taking yeah. up energy or space in my life. But if it's meant to help me, I'm going to pause. I'm going to go to the step three. Because if it's meant to help me, I want to evaluate it in a way that feels reflective of my thoughts and my goals. Yeah. So if it's meant to help me, we go to step three. 
which is what do I want to do with the feedback? And I love this because even though it's pass number one and pass number two, I still get the ultimate decision on what I want to do. I can throw it out. I could say that's great feedback. It's meant to help me. And you know what? It's not a fit for me right now. I could say, oh, okay, wow. I, I see what you're saying. I'm going to take the good things from that. And I'm going to incorporate part of that into what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I may say, you know what? It's a great idea. I'm going to bench it for now. I'm going to come back to it at a time that feels right for me. It puts me in the driver's seat, gives me control of the situation and what I'm receiving. And I get to move forward with that feedback or criticism in a way that feels empowering to me. So if I've gone through those three steps, at the end of the day, I'm moving forward with that in a way that is meant to make me better. And that's positive to me. I love that. You have a motto of safety third. I don't know what that means, but I love the way it sounds. Help, help me understand what, what, what that is. <laughs> yes. So this kind of started as a joke when I was a kid. It was like a family joke. My dad is a little bit accident prone. And he'd always say like, oh, safety third, you know, like, whoops. <laughs> but I took that into my skating as this motto. And it really meant for me to go out and to try new things. In skating, really the only way to learn things is by doing it. So if I'm up in the air in a lift and I want to do a dismount where I turn upside down and I spin one rotation and then my partner catches me, there's only one way for me to do that. And that's to just do it. Right. And I think that if I had stayed in my comfort zone, in the things that felt safe, in the areas that I knew I could do what I was going to do, I wouldn't have excelled. We wouldn't have achieved the things that we achieved. And we really would never have discovered our potential. So safety third was kind of my way of saying, you know what, go out there, take risks and learn from them. And I've brought that into my entrepreneurship, my entrepreneurial career, because again, the same thing is necessary. You have to go out and take risks. You have to get uncomfortable. You have to put yourself into situations where you don't necessarily know what's going to happen. But by pushing yourself, by, you know, getting out of that safety zone, you're going to learn more. You're going to accelerate what you're capable of. You're going to learn new boundaries, new extremes. And I really feel like it's a catalyst for growth. Um, so it sounds funny. <laughs> I know. It, it, I think it may be the most badass motto I've ever heard anybody actually say. Because re really what you just said is like, hey, I have to go. I'm on these little like razor blade ice skates and I'm going to jump and I'm going to like try to spin around three times as fast as I can. And I'm not really sure what's going to happen. But like, oh. We're going to try it anyways and we'll find out. And like, yes, I love that. That's exactly it. I remember yeah. trying a, a throw quad for the first time, which we never landed a throw quad. A lot of people, when I competed, no one was doing it. Yeah. And so the first time we were going to go try this, I went to my coach who's never done a throw quad ever. And I was like, okay, hey, what, what should I do? And my coach was like, just keep rotating for longer. <laughs> it's like, what a novel idea. Yeah, you're right. right. Let me just do yeah. one more rotation. Great. <laughs> but that's sure. what I went and did. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, it, I love it. And I, I mean, it's, it's the reason why, you know, I love doing this podcast and having these conversations because I, I think it, I think entrepreneurship combined with athletics are like, like the two things that I admire most. And, and we've covered so many of those topics, but entrepreneurship is almost exactly that. Like it, like, look, you might fail. Like you might fall. Like there's, let's be honest. Like it's not easy. A lot of people do. Um, but like the only way you're going to really know is if you dive in and you do it, you know? And, and, and I think that that's what it's all about. And I think that's what the, uh, the great entrepreneurs are able to, to do. I mean, I think it's controlled risk, right? Like, you know, let's be smart totally. about it. Let's yes. be smart about it. But at the same time, you kind of got to put your fears to the side. And if you believe in yourself and you believe in what you're doing, you just got to go. I couldn't agree more. I think it's a great summary. All right. Well, hey, um, we're coming up on it. Uh, where can people find you? Yeah, follow me on Instagram at Paige Lawrence Coaching. I would love to meet any of your listeners. I love people to yeah. come in, introduce themselves, start a conversation. 
Absolutely. Well, listen, I had a, a, a great time. I appreciate you uh, humoring me and uh, answering all the questions I've always had about the uh, the Olympic journey and, and then just being able to kind of talk shop. Yes. I mean, this has been so fun. And I will also say that just popped into my brain because I've been talking so much about preparing and the power of having a plan. I actually have a monthly planning freebie that I would love to share with your audience. If they are looking for a little bit more structure in their life, like I will yeah. share a link with you and please do that. Yeah. I'll yeah. include that in the show notes. Cool. Let's do that. Thank you for having me. This has been a, such a fun conversation and I could have talked for another hour. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Paige. Thank you very much. Take care.